Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, um, Accessible Electronic Resources for All. Our presenter today is Angela Dresselhaus, um, who is an Acquisitions and Electronic Resources Librarian at the University of Montana in Missoula. And we're really excited for her to join us today and share about information um, information about the library's role in providing equal access to electronic databases, streaming media, and other online materials. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have us have her with us today. Um, but before handing over the ball to Angela, I was just going to go over some logistics so that everyone um, on the line knows what our process is going to be. So if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to enter these into the chat box. And we will compile these and then ask them to Angela at the end of the webinar um, during Q&A. And as, if you have more questions during Q&A, just feel free to chat or send them to the chat box. And in addition, if you run into any technical issues, um, like you can't hear the audio or somehow aren't seeing the slides, um, please enter those issues into the chat box as well. And we'll have our tech support, Carl Hess, um, help you out during the webinar. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to it um, after this is over via email as well as an evaluation form. So with that, um, we will hand it over to Angela. OK, hello, everyone. Um, is my screen visible? OK. Today, I'm going to talk about electronic resource accessibility for individuals with disabilities. This talk is about access, and access for all individuals regardless of their abilities. The move from print to electronic format had the potential to increase immediate access to materials for patrons with disabilities. However, many devices and formats have emerged that were just as inaccessible without intervention as the printed word on paper. For example, Streaming media without captions are common, despite the advances in standardization of cap captioning. Websites are created that are completely inaccessible to a blind individual, and I'll show you an example of this later in the talk. I will address some key accessibility issues, provide an overview. Excuse me, it looks like my slides aren't quite working. Okay. So I'm going to address some key issues provide an overview of electronic text formats, ebook readers, evaluation tools, and how creating a collection of and how to create a collection development policy to support access to all users. Finally, I hope to leave you with the idea that accessibility in the digital age isn't about providing accommodations or other interventions, but it's really about immediate access for all individuals. I would like to reframe this talk away from a legal compliance issue and focus on user-centered discussion. I attended an unconference on accessibility at the University of Montana, and what spoke to me most was the concept that accessibility is about obtaining the same information at the same time, for the same price, and the same quality. This applies as follows. If there's an ebook available to sighted users, that same verbatim text should be available in a format that's compatible with text-to-speech. For films, caption and descriptive summaries provide an accessible experience to individuals with hearing and visual impairments. The Described and Captioned Media Program is an organization that will caption educational materials and general interest films and make them available for qualified individuals at no cost. The National Library Service provides talking and braille books for no charge. These are examples of the same information. However, each scenario has the potential to introduce a lifetime in access. For example, captioning takes time if the coding is not done at the same time as production. Is a lag time between the point of need and fulfillment acceptable? And is that accessibility? Cost is simple. No markups for accessibility features. Or really, is it that simple? 
You might wonder, who would charge extra for accessibility? In 2009, the Authors Guild claimed that Amazon's text-to-speech feature was a violation of copyright. One solution offered by the Guild was to create a registry of disabled users and to charge the disabled population extra for an accessible version. One other example, Amazon chose to allow publishers to opt out of text-to-speech features in order to protect the publisher's audiobook sales. Subsequently, the Joint Statement on Access to Books by Americans with Print Disabilities was released by the Reading Rights Coalition and the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers. The statement recognized the buying power of Americans with print disabilities and they agreed to work together towards more accessible books. Same quality can also be an issue. A student at my university requested an accept accessible version of a textbook through the Disability Student Services Office. The publisher had an electronic file of the book, but would not provide files for the student. The accessible PDF file created for the student by the university did not have the same functionality as the publisher created electronic text. The PDF was inferior to the publisher's electronic files. People who are blind, hearing impaired, or have other disabilities require access just like anyone else. But the ways they interact with materials are simply different. People with seizure disorders have certain requirements to keep their media consumption safe. Physical limitations also require alternative access methods. For example, the National Library Service that provides talking and braille books also serves individuals with physical disabilities that prevent them from holding or manipulating books. When the library cares about how individuals interact with materials, we become an inclusive environment. And there are benefits to fostering inclusiveness, including allowing greater access to opportunities in the community, higher education, and the workplace. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was passed to address disability discrimination. And I'm going to cover two sections. Uh, Section 504 extends civil rights to people with disabilities. This provided an avenue for people to seek remedy for discriminatory practices. The Department of Justice and the, and the Department of Education have offices to investigate complaints. The right to reasonable accommodations in the workplace and educational settings was also established. And the final key point about Section 504 that I'll highlight is that no disabled person can be excluded from programs or activities that are funded by federal agencies. So Section 508 addresses online interfaces and data systems. Um, it goes on to state that federal employees with disabilities must have access to and use of information and data that is comparable to the access and use by federal employees who are not individuals with disabilities unless an undue burden would be imposed on that agency. Many website best practices for accessibility were established to comply with Section 508. And final of all, discuss is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. It established that no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity or be subject to discrimination by any public entity. The important expansion um, is to public entities that are not funded by the federal government and to schools who receive state funding. Providing accessible electronic resource access in the library is complicated, and the federal government provides little guidance to state agencies on how to meet accessibility requirements. And Fulton suggests that Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act could serve as a blueprint for information technology guidelines that state agencies should follow. Again, I focus my attention to the user experience, but awareness of the legislation regarding accessibility <coughs> is important. And I found that my work in libraries, the user experience angle, is much more productive in terms of garnering support than the threat of legal consequences. The American Library Association has also produced literature to guide librarians. ALA drafted a resolution called the Purchasing of Accessible Electronic Resources. It stated that libraries should require vendors to guarantee accessible products. 
and that libraries ensure accessibility through their own testing or by requiring vendors to test. And then funding bodies should provide adequate financial resources for accessibility issues. The ALA resolution highlights a triad approach to accessibility that shares responsibility and encourages funding for activities. Vendors have the opportunity to help libraries become compliant, especially with Section 508. But the library still has a responsibility to spot check and to ensure that purchased materials are accessible. However, one of the most substantial roadblocks is funding. Testing in a library is hindered if there is no funding to hire an employee to conduct checks. Even automated checks require human intervention. Your local library association or your institution may have policies and guidelines to follow. For example, the University of Montana is currently in the process of implementing a comprehensive electronic information accessibility plan, which I'll talk about a little later. So before I jump into web standards, I'm going to go over a few of the basic functional requirements for websites. And this will help frame the conversation so that you can identify what websites, uh, what problems websites could have. So uh, one of the first elements, all graphical elements must have a text equivalent, and that is especially important for links. Um, this is kind of a, an older design style, but if you had it, an interest to a website that was just simply some sort of picture, that wouldn't come across on a screen reader, so it's important to make sure that those are described. Synchronized equivalent alternatives are a must, and that means um, things like caption video, transcripts of any audio, or other alternative alternatives for multimedia. And color should not be used as the only method for identifying elements on the web page or any data. It's also important to be aware of using certain colors for text. A simple Google search will help you find a couple tools so that you can get a preview of what a website would look like to people with uh, different forms of color deficiencies. Screen flicker frequency should also be limited, limited or completely eliminated in order to reduce, reduce seizure risk. And then online electronic forms should be properly labeled and follow a logical order. There should also be a method to skip repetitive navigation links. A sighted user would not be hindered by repetitive navigation because our eyes can scan materials and quickly skip unneeded information. But a screen reader will read every link from top to bottom. Skip functions allow for an efficient user experience. Alerts on kind responses for any pages um, where they are required should be provided. The user should even be given an opportunity to indicate that more time is needed. And you may have seen this type of feature while purchasing items online in the shopping cart or while registering for a conference. So these lists may sound familiar. These elements are key to a well-designed website that could be appreciated by all users, including people without disabilities. So the goal of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is to make the web more accessible. It's based on four concepts, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. The web must be available to the senses, and this primarily relates to vision and hearing, either through a browser or through assistive technologies such as screen readers, screen enlargers, or other types of technology. Users must be able to interact with all the controls and interactive elements using either the mouse, keyboard, or an assistive device. And the content should be clear, and it should not produce confusion or introduce ambiguity. And finally, a wide range of technologies should be able to access and interpret the content. Another standard to be aware of is ARIA. The goal is to make, again, the web more accessible, and it does this by addressing problems with advanced user interface controls that are often not available to people who can't use a mouse or who use a screen reader. These features include drag and drop, the ability to alert screen readers to updated content, date sliders, such as the ones seen on article databases to limit search results and pull, and pull down menus. These are all features that are kind of new and they make websites a little snazzier. And so it's important that when you provide 
an experience to a sighted user, that that same experience is available to others as well. The addition of elements in ARIA will help users with disabilities have the equivalent experience on the web. The website accessibility checker that I'm going to demonstrate later will highlight some ARIA elements. So I'm going to address media now, and this is uh, it includes streaming media, but it's um, it's relative to the physical media that you can purchase and have in the library. Um, captions are um, it, captions are extremely important to the deaf and hard of hearing communities. Verbatim text are the most helpful type of captions. Edited captions and or transcripts that are not synchronized uh, do not give full access to the media, and they are considered inferior. And subtitles can function similarly to the true captions. These are there are technical differences in how they are generated and recorded, but there's not an impact on quality for end users. I'm going to describe, uh, this is a feature that many people may not know and it is um, relevant to uh, visually impaired individuals. It's called descriptive video services, and it involves trained professionals who use pauses and dialogue to describe the scene. The primary users of descriptive video services are individuals with vision limitations. Audio-only input is not able to capture all aspects of a movie or a film. If you think about a horror movie, the dialogue would be understandable, it's able to be heard, but it's equally important to describe the monster hiding under the bed to convey the full meaning of a horror movie and the scene. And libraries should make every attempt to purchase media that is already captioned or already described. Doing so will build a collection that is immediately accessible to all people. Captioning on demand is not an ideal situation. Many of us have probably had a few instructors rushing to find videos at the last minute. If movies with captions cannot be purchased, the library should try to caption these upon receipt as soon as they can. This is, and I'm going to describe, um, not everyone is aware that you can do captioning. Um, after the fact, and a lot of universities provide this service through IT. So this is how we do it at UM. We request permissions from the publisher of the media in order to comply with copyright law, and you know we go for exceptions under um, individuals with disabilities. The second step, we create a transcript, uh, and we keep recommended standards in mind. And then third, the transcript is synchronized with the recording. And then the final product can be produced in multiple formats um, because we can host, we'll decide where to host it based on the copyright restrictions. But we've created files for iTunes, use and local servers, and even YouTube. So I'm going to move on to websites, journals, and databases. There's a lot of sim similarities between all of these. Lazier et al. conducted a study using established web guidelines set forth in Section 508 of the U.S. Rehabilitation Act. They found that 24 public library websites in the study failed to meet accessibility requirements. All libraries failed to meet at least two requirements, and some websites failed up to six requirements. The most common violations were text equivalents were not provided, online electronic forms were not proper properly labeled or presented in a logical order, and the method to skip repetitive navigation was often absent. Databases can provide some of, or have some of the similar issues. Uh, Tadamir and Durrance evaluated 32 library databases with a checklist method created by the author. The study concluded that 72% of evaluated databases were rated as marginally accessible or inaccessible. These databases failed three or more of the 10 accessibility elements outlined on the checklist. So I want to share what I consider to be a complete website fail. Uh, the beginning of the video will show um, how a sighted individual interacts with a website and then the screen reader will be used to access the same site. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to have the sound work, but what I can do is narrate for you.
So this website is just going through, there's a little bit of um, sounds for band-aids being ripped off and you see that a person can click on a button and then have various pop-outs <coughs> to interact with this website. Now the screen reader JAWS is starting to read and up at the top in the yellow it is just reading tab, tab, unlimited, unlabeled five buttons. And what you can't hear but what I can hear because of my sound, the screen reader isn't finding any content at all. And so this website, someone who's using a screen reader, they couldn't even access any piece of this other than this home page. All the content that we saw before is completely inaccessible. And in this website, one thing that is really kind of annoying, and I wish you could hear it, but all these bars that are different colors, and you can now see them being highlighted, those are just simply tabs, and that's a navigational feature without any kind of context at all. And so I think this is clearly an example of a website that is completely inaccessible and it's um, hard to imagine that that type of situation exists. Okay, let me get my PowerPoint back up. I think um, when you see these types of demonstrations, it's, it's kind of a wake-up call. And if you want to go in, on YouTube and kind of see how a screen reader works, there are several um, demonstrations and some interesting things that you can discover on your own with just a simple web search. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to electronic book formats and e-readers. There are several file formats to discuss. The DAISY system, it's a format that was specifically designed for people with print disabilities. And this is the format that is used for talking books created by the National Library Service. Um, most people outside of the, the blind um, do not really know it about this format. It, it is very specific, specialized. Um, EPUB format, it's the most commonly used ebook format, and the structure is similar to HTML. And this is the format that is native, um, natively used on most platforms and devices except for the Kindle. Unfortunately, EPUB 2 does not support rich media and interactivity. And this is an important drawback because some of the newer electronic textbooks incorporate interactive features and videos. And those things would not be available. Um, at my university, more and more classes are offering a textbook that is more like an online class. And it's not accessible if, or it's not appropriate if everyone in the classroom cannot get the same instructional experience. So EPUB 3 is based on XHTML5, and it will support rich media and interactivity, including audio and video, math formulas, and pronunciation suggestions. Uh, the pronunciation suggestions are really important, and I'll give you an example to, uh, to, to demonstrate this. Um, on my resume, MLS, which is my degree, is read milliliters by screen readers. And, you know, it gets funny after a while, but it, you really should be able to specify when uh, certain abbreviations are not the standard like milliliters instead of masters of library science. So text, TXT, is a universal format, and it's easily read by screen readers. And HTML is also a universal format, which is widely known and that is easily read by screen readers as well. It's um, easier to read the websites if the document is well structured. PDF files, this can become a little complicated. The files have the potential to be easily read by screen readers if the documents are properly saved into a PDF format and scanned documents are processed with an OCR utility. OCR does have its limitations especially on text that deviates from the standard fonts that are intelligible to OCR software. Unfortunately, many documents are not accessible 
and there's a there's a there's an acronym that people some people use in, in some um, some communities that uh, PDF actually stands for people with disabilities and I'm not going to say that last F but we can say that it's left out in the cold is a more polite way to say and you know when you hear these things at the conferences it really it I mean it really stuck with me that wow um, this is these are the people I need to listen to to really understand what is accessible and then what is beyond accessible but what is comfortable to use and convenient which is also very important the Mobi and AZW file it's used by Kindle and it can be read by screen readers with appropriate applications, but there are some limitations um, and difficulties with refreshable Braille output. So then move on to electronic book readers. Apple products are the most accessible and widely known devices. iOS has a built-in text-to-speech feature. That's especially helpful to people who do not want to install a screen reader program like JAWS or NVDA. The text-to-speech reader is also available on handheld devices, including the iPhone. The National Federation of the Blind has a couple of YouTube videos that demonstrate refreshable Braille compatibility as well as any other key features. If you've not heard of or seen a demonstration of refreshable Braille, I'd highly recommend getting on YouTube and searching for some of those. It's very interesting and many people think of Braille as a static thing on paper, but in actuality it can be a mechanical device and there's even some developments to have uh, touch screens develop bumps in, in the form of Braille. It's very interesting and I'm excited to watch any kind of developments in that area. So Blio is a software reader only. It was developed by the National Federation for the Blind in conjunction with the Kurzweil Technology Corporation. The software was designed with accessibility in mind and it's popular among people who are blind. And again this is a, a a very small, um, it's, it's, not, it's not widely known because it is very um, specialized. And then the Kobo and the Nook Sony Reader and the Kindle, they all range from having some usability problems to completely inaccessible. Full access to menus is often not available because of lack of text-to-speech that applies to menus. And then not all the features are available. And a blind user often cannot use the device straight out of the package without the help of a sighted user. And that's something people with their sight may not ever think about. But if you are a blind individual, that is how you live your life. And you would want everything that you order, everything that you purchase, to come to you in a way that is accessible and that you could use on your own without assistance. You know, the later models of Kindles are much better. However, the last workshop that I attended the blind and low vision attendees still prefer Apple products. Now I think it's important to address some of the barriers faced by people with disabilities. The, uh, the NFB has lobbied Amazon since the inception of the Kindle because of a lack of accessibility features. The original Kindle Fire surprisingly does not have a native text-to-speech option. Um, however, the, new, the newer Kindles do have text-to-speech, but Amazon permits publishers to disable this feature. The Kindle application for PC requires an accessibility plugin and must be used with the screen reader software. So again, this is something else that it's not coming straight out of the box. You have to do something additional in order to get an accessible version. Uh, furthermore, Kindle developed their own hotkeys for activating the read aloud features, it, which renders the Braille output useless. And then functionally, a new set of hotkeys for the text-to-speech feature is like changing a copy command from Control-C to Control-P or any other, um, e any other control combination that really is not a standard use item. So when Kindle entered the K-12 market and schools began implementing them in classrooms, the NFB mobilized. Many of the Kindles used in the programs were not fully accessible to students. Blind students were unable to um, en enable the text-to-speech option without assistance, and they were unable to use the footnotes, the dictionary, or to participate in collaborative note-taking. So on, on May 1st, as we the development, they finally released an accessible iOS application for Apple devices. However, footnotes and endnotes, text selection, 
notes, highlights, and the dictionary, and most unfortunately the Braille output, still have some critical flaws. And for, I'm going to recommend that if you want more information about ebook readers um, and accessibility, there's a really great Dear Colleague letter issued by the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, and I can provide the, this PowerPoint has the link in the, in the notes section. And I would really encourage everyone to read that. It's, it's short and it gives a really, a really good picture of what's going on in ebooks. It's very informative. So the University of Montana is responding to an Office of Civil Rights complaint regarding accessibility issues on campus. Blind students, in conjunction with the Disability Student Rights Group on campus, filed a complaint with the Department of Education, and this complaint is currently under investigation by the Office of Civil Rights. The library databases were named as inaccessible resources. The complaint also named several other campus-wide issues, but I'm going to stick to what, what affects the library. So in response to the investigation, several members of the campus community, including members from the library, gathered to draft, an to draft a document addressing technology accessibility. Our document and plan calls for aggressive actions to resolve a long-term problem on campus. The areas that pertain to the library are, we will continue to scan and create accessible PDF documents for faculty on a case-by-case -case basis, and we have also started to offer faculty professional development sessions to let faculty know how to do this themselves or to um, reassure them that the library can help and to make sure that we have high visibility for the service. We will also monitor accessibility of online databases and to work to provide universal access to library collections and services. We're planning or we will purchase captioned and audio described versions of new instructional media and other audio visual media. We will maintain a library of captioned media resources that are available for faculty, staff, and student use. We will also maintain a record of all the permissions for captioning and digitization of copyrighted media works. We will assist faculty by identifying materials that are captioned prior to purchase, or we will find suitable alternatives to media products that are, that are not captioned. So as the acquisitions and electronic resources librarian, I will soon begin a process to accommodate the changes in our media and acquisitions workflow. At this time, I'm unsure about how we will begin to monitor accessibility of the electronic databases on a consistent manner. So far, I've done individual checks, and it's really more of an, a way to plan for the future, but we are not doing any systematic checks. Currently, we just don't have the staff that we would need to do this sort of systematic check and documentation of the accessibility of our, of our resources. And this goes back to the ALA recommendations that funding really needs to be supported in, or, in order to make library resources, or to get, get us closer to having compliant collections. So the recent settlement between the University of California and the disability rights advocates address library databases as well. The settlement outlined that the library will make control resources accessible, or library control resources accessible, but they are not held liable for third-party databases. So this is in contrast to our uh, policy at the moment. So our document does not include a provision that exclude that a provision that that states that we are only responsible for things that we generate and we don't have a, this is something that's might, that will probably cause a little bit of a challenge for the library because there really isn't much that the library can do to change the accessibility features of a database provided by a vendor. Now that I'm going to move on to how to evaluate. And I realize I just said tools to evaluate, and I'm about to talk about people. So people are not tools. They're individuals who are very helpful. So I should make sure that I change that in the future. Uh, so while there are tools to, access, to assess accessibility automatically, the best method is to use human evaluators. These automatic checkers generally only focus on technical requirements. A human user can evaluate the technical requirements and also give feedback on the user experience. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not just providing adequate service, it's 
you know, it's the same type of service. It's the, it's a unique, or it's the same kind of experience that would be ex that would be available to a sighted person and for someone who is not sighted. So librarians are concerned about the user experience, and I think this is a chance where librarians can get a holistic view of the user population, and including individuals with disabilities in routine focus user focus groups or other testing methods would also provide valuable information for new library interfaces and initiatives. So there's a, um, I want to talk about a couple web, web tools, and so one is called WAVE, and it's used to evaluate websites, and it's at a great price, it is free. And so I've already loaded, this is the University of Montana's website, and it's, this is a, a very helpful and easy to access, um, or it has a very low barrier. So it's, it's very simple to use. You can see that there are highlighted areas. And we have a couple red, which we discussed earlier. Make sure that you don't just use color to identify issues. But see this, I can click on it and it will tell me that there's a missing form label. And the form control does not have a corresponding label. And if that doesn't make sense to you, you can click on more information and you can go over to the left side of the screen and you can get information about what it means and why it's important, how to fix it, uh, just more information. And what I find extremely helpful, if you're interested in the standards behind what generates, uh, what generates this output, there's a section for standards and guidelines and it's all hyperlinked and it's very easy to use. And so I mentioned that this tool also has some ARIA issue for ARIA additions. And so this program will only tell you that one something is available. And so ARIA will help the user have all users have the same experience. And again, you can click on the more information and you can see what it means. But in this case, you're not going to find what specific implementation of ARIA is available. And so you can see that the website does have a few problems. And then at the bottom, we have these unnamed headings, so there's no content in these headings. So there's a little bit of improvement that the website can go through. Anybody who's familiar with Drupal, you know, we do have to work in the, in the constraints of that software. But this, this website is, 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 it needs some work, to be honest. And one of the nice things about this tool, you can start to navigate to other areas of your web page to see how how others how other pages are working and you don't have to go outside of the tool. So I just clicked on our A to Z database link. And this is generated by Spring Share. And you see that there's a message that's applying to the whole page, which is usually um, there's some major overarching element that is forgotten. But for the most part, many elements are here and this a screen reader would render this well. Additionally, you could follow through for your databases. A lot of times you'll have to log into your proxy server because you are coming through another, uh, another, another IP range. So I'm going to try to get back to my slideshow. Okay, so that's a quick demonstration of WAVE. And that's, that's a tool that is highly recommended by our disability service coordinator here at Eman. And this next, um, it's called P. It's photosensitive epilepsy analysis tool, and it analyzes videos for risky material. It's capable of detecting general flash failures, red flash failures, and extended flash warnings. An episode of a popular cartoon called Pokemon was pulled from TV due to seizure risk. Um, and so the seizure risk. I mean, this was just very interesting to me, and it was confirmed through the incidence of seizure among people with known cases of epilepsy, and then people with no history. So when this cartoon came out, suddenly children were some children were experiencing seizures for the first time, which you could probably imagine that would be frightening for a parent. So this is a, a graphic that is the output of the peak software, and so these red peaks that and the white bits, they show where the white flash and red flash are at unacceptable levels. And you can see that the acceptable levels or where it's cautioned is very low on this graph. And so you can see just how um, egregious these flash errors are. And so this software is pretty easy to install. 
and the program is uh, pretty computer uh, resource intensive, but most, com most computers can handle it. So I'm going to, I won't read all the, uh, the Tatamere accessibility checklist, but this is very helpful um, if you just want to find an easy way to jump in and just kind of conceptualize some things before using some tools. Um, and we've heard about a lot of these before, accessible PDF versions, clearly labeled page elements, you know, limiting the use of programming languages that are not accessible. So I want to discuss um, the VPET and the by accessible wizard. That's um, these. This is a template that vendors can use to describe how their products meet accessibility guidelines. And the U.S. government maintains a list of vendors and publishers, at, um, and their VPETs or their accessibility statements. This website, unfortunately, is under maintenance, and I've not been able to get consistent access to the by accessible wizard. But fortunately, many of the vendors publish uh, this information on their web pages, and it's really just a, a quick and simple Google search away to find it. But what's interesting about this um, VPET list, several vendors for the library are actually on it. It's not inclusive, but it is interesting to see um, the government has a list of things that it pertains to the library and that we could use it, so there are resources out there for us. So collection development is important, and I think this is really the backbone. Um, the policies, collection development policies that reflect accessibility needs are important tools for building the collection for all, all patrons. And I'm going to discuss what we're doing at UM. So our legacy print collections will still be subject to established accommodations, and new print materials will simply be added to this collection, and they'll be made accessible through scanning and or in-person readers, just as before. Um, if we digitize any materials, they are going to be developed with accessibility in mind. We'll use OCR and quality control to produce digital collections. We're also very concerned with accessibility of the platforms used to host digital collections. When we went out for a request for proposal for an institutional repository software, part of the required materials was uh, an assessment of dis disability access compliance. And this is also true for our discovery layer, and this is going to happen uh, through our state purchasing procedures on any type of new um, material. So media, we are going to purchase uh, any media with captions, and things that do not have captions will be captioned by our uh, IT department. And this also applies to any media generated by the library, even if it's not formally cataloged. And so this is important for us, because we do produce several videos about instruction and library collections, and they really are part of what the library, it, it is part of our collection, and it's very important, and so we're going to make sure that everything that we do is accessible. So as far as databases and journals, electronic resources that have accessible web interfaces are a must. Many of the functional criteria outlined earlier in this pre presentation should be available. It's important to keep in mind that a platform with an accessible PDF is not useful if the screen reader cannot discover and access the content due to a poorly designed interface. So electronic readers. So Apple, Apple iPad and iBooks are highly accessible and popular among people with print disabilities. And so far my library has only purchased iPads since other devices such as the Kindle and Nook have been named in civil rights complaints. So I'm going to move on to licensing, and this is, uh, this is not in the collection development policy, but it supports collection development. So there are a few ways to address licensing for electronic resources, and my first course of action at UM was to develop an addendum that states the library's support for accessibility. The document included some functional requirements listed early in the presentation. I sent the addendum to several vendors in order just to open a conversation about accessibility. The library approached this as a non-binding agreement. However, several vendors' legal departments declined to recognize the addendum. And so this work was done prior to the complaint because of my interest in starting that conversation about accessibility. So after the complaint was filed, uh, we needed to take more action and I searched the web for established language that could be added to licensing or licenses. 
And I work in conjunction with the Disability Service Coordinator, the Library Dean, and the Legal Department to tweak the statement. Getting buy-in and support from all of those entities really helped create a statement um, that can be used and, and helpful for us. And so the language will be included on all new license agreements. And the statement addresses laws that we are required to be in compliance with, a support for assistive technology, we require our current EPAT, and we require that the vendor use web best practices outlined in the presentation. And there are resources that do not comply, and so we, we will address those on an individual case-by-case -case basis, but we will not be required to uh, cancel subscriptions to materials that are not accessible, but we will make every effort to at least make accommodations after the point of need. So education, it's uh, extremely important and really all library employees need some sort of information uh, about accessibility and even down to uh, etiquette regarding how to interact with various people. So the digital transition in libraries presented an opportunity for us to provide an increased level of accessibility to all patrons, but unfortunately this didn't happen. So assuming that all electronic materials are accessible will lead to complacency. And this is something that I, I think some people are surprised. They think, of course, electronic, you can listen to it, it's accessible, it's easy to use, but that's not always the case. So most people have heard that term, reasonable accommodation. And my hope is, after this presentation, that we will all leave with the realization that a reasonable accommodation often happens at the point of need. And in a digital environment, the old notions of accommodation are no longer acceptable in many communities. When we're accommodating at that point of need, then that's, uh, that's offering a delay. And so in the digital environment, we do have the opportunity to have seamless access on, at the same time. So calling back to the beginning of the presentation, accessibility should be the same materials, same time, same price, and the same quality. So I would like to thank Alex for this opportunity to present this web webinar, and I'm very happy that everyone um, was able to join me today to hear about this topic. Thanks, Angela. That was great. Um, it looks like we do have a few questions, so um, I'll go ahead and ask you the first question that was asked. Um, and if people have more questions, just feel free to send them in. Um, so the first question is, have you ever dealt with interlibrary loan requests from those with visual disability, um, especially if the document that came, uh, came practically was a scanned PDF? and not accessible. Okay, so in the case where the document comes inaccessible, so it's done as an image, there's not anything that can be done easily, and the recommended practice would be to go back to the lending library and request that an OCR be done. Um, I don't personally work in ILL, but that's, um, that's how the standard is in, in the unit. And so that's what that would be the only way to make that document accessible. Great. And um, another question that we have is regarding media purchased. Um, do you caption immediately, or do you wait until you have a request um, to provide the captions? So unfortunately, we're in a state of uh, complete purchasing freeze, so we've not had a chance to implement this policy, but the goal is um, the acquisition staff who works on media, she is reaching out to vendors and finding media that is already captioned. In many cases, that's the, that is what will happen, and now we're, we're under the assumption that once we receive the material, it will go out to our IT services that does the captioning, and so there's a, there's a rate that they charge for that by minute. But it's, an, it's, it's just going, that cost will be just part of our acquisition budget in the future. Okay, and um, another question that we have, 
Um, do you have a list of available plugins and settings that can make various e-readers more accessible? I have a list of uh, web resources, and I can certainly add that type of information to it. Um, so it, I guess it's Vicki, uh, if you could just keep that question, and I'll, I'll add that to the links that I send out. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great if you can compile additional resources for us. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. How do you do accessibility checks for current software you are using? Um, as an example, Articulate for recording online lectures has a notes page. Um, is that notes page accessible to screen readers? That's just an example, but in general, would you check that software is accessible? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question with new changes that are happening in class okay, so technology. What, I want to try to restate this question to make sure that I understand it. Um, so is a question about software programs in general used to create instructional materials like videos and I guess podcasts or audio files? Is that what the question pertains to? I'm, I think yes. that would be one way you, yes, yeah. And if you have another way that you think it might be, I, um, other people may be interested in. Okay, so I, I, I can try it. Okay, so um, we have uh, a unit on campus that deals specifically with uh, software purchases, and they are handling, evaluating the um, accessibility features and the functionality, and we have a, a unit that's especially focused on um, online instruction. And so the, I, I can speak to the, um, the beginning of the process for acquiring software. We have to, um, we have to look at accessibility requirements. We look at the VPAS to make sure that they are generally in compliance with Section uh, with, with 508. So, um, so I can't really speak too much other than that's uh, to what I, I don't have much more to add to that. Okay, and see, the next question it looks like is, um, can WAVE, the WAVE tool access e-resources that we license to? Uh, for example, access that requires you to go through some sort of authentication method? Yes and no. Um, about half of the time when I work for, re um, when I'm working on resources just to see what's going on, if I can keep one browser open and not get things confused, I can usually go almost all the way through a database just from that initial view. Uh, there are times when I, I think that settings are remembered and it's just, it's not working in, in the way that I expect. I'm often required to go through a proxy server, but um, and that, that's, that gives you a chance to see if what your students are logging into is also accessible. So with EBSCOhost, if I were to follow through, what you would have seen is our login for off-campus access, and you would have been able to see how well that was accessible to screen readers, and then you would have been able to see the EBSCO interface as well, or you know, any database that you chose. Okay. Um, if no one, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, so we can go ahead and wrap up. Unless oh, it looks like there's one more, one more. Less. We can take this last question unless anyone has anything burning they want to ask. Um, so have you had the opportunity to communicate with e-resource vendors um, about accessibility? Yes, the initial, uh, the initial time that I sent out the addendum, I was, you know, I had phone calls and I had emails back and forth and I've seen a couple people in person about accessibility. And it's something that I think most people are sympathetic to. But I think even vendors face that same lack of resources to make sure that all of their resources are accessible. And then there's just so much content out there. 
and it's very difficult. So when I speak to other people, I think everyone wants the same goal, but there are barriers to reaching that. Okay, and actually I have one last question um, for you. I guess as many of us may be um, acquisitions or electronic resources librarians at our own libraries, uh, what would you recommend for us to do as our first steps if we haven't, if this is new information to us? I think that the um, PowerPoint that I'll send out has a lot of great links um, in the notes field to start. But even something as simple as a, a Google search, just to see what's out there first. And then, of course, you can always go into paid electronic resources to find more information. But th there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good resources out there that's freely available. Um, I'd also recommend going to organizations that um, advocate for people with disabilities, and you can find a lot of good information there as well. Okay, great. Um, that was a really great presentation, and I hope everyone um, attending is able to learn something and take away some information today. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for now. Um, as a reminder, um, there'll be an email. And I'll switch to this PowerPoint, which has some additional information. Um, so look for an email with an evaluation form and a, you'll also receive a link to this recording. Um, and then thank you to our presenter, Angela, and to our tech support, Carl, today. And then if you want information about future um, Alex webinars, uh, please visit our website. Um, or future um, sessions that you can attend. Um, so thanks again, and I hope everyone has a great um, rest of the year this year. <laughs>